Hey everyone, I'm Dan from jazzcomposerspresent.com, an online space where composers, musicians, and listeners come together to celebrate the music we love. I'm joined today by Rich DeRosa, drummer, arranger, Grammy-nominated composer, and director of jazz composition and arranging at the University of North Texas. Rich is here to show us how to orchestrate for mixed woodwinds. Today I'm going to talk about uh, this world of when we decide to write for orchestral winds how different an experience and a result that is than when we're sitting and playing piano. This is particularly important if you've been primarily working as a jazz arranger for big band, where all the instruments are pretty much evenly weighted and, uh, and they balance and uh, the color is much more uniform. Um, let's take a look at the, the first score. And you can see what I did here. I put it in the context of a woodwind quartet. And uh, you see I added colored lines there to kind of show what sonically what the result is. The flute is in that kind of rather transparent gold color. And the oboe, which is much more uh, prominent in, in the ensemble sound, is in that punchy red. The clarinet is in much more of a, a you know, cool blue type thing. Uh, definitely more uh, noticeable than the gold in the flute. And of course, the bassoon is got the dark color. It's the heaviest ensemble, I mean, in the heaviest instrument in the ensemble. So the thing is, is that each one of these instruments is now going to uh, take its the notes that it's been given. And it's more like when we're looking at a graph, right, with four different lines and different colors and we can follow, sometimes the lines might even cross, right? But the, uh, when we're looking at a graph, we're seeing, we can track these lines. This is what writing for orchestral winds is really uh, more about. And so we don't notice that at all, do we? When we're looking at the piano, playing at the piano, because it's four notes, all the same color, let's say. The other thing I want you to realize is that if you take a look at the, the uh, notes on the sketch, that first voicing is not even playable at the piano. So that's a really good indication a lot of times that you don't want to necessarily play piano. That's not the best way to voice these woodwinds. So also take a look at the interval between the flute, which is the weakest instrument in the ensemble, and the oboe which is very much stronger. Look at the distance. I'm trying to protect that flute so it can have a fighting chance to project against the other three stronger instruments. And finally, the other thing I'm gonna mention is that this little example here is in D minor and it cadences in A major. But the first chord is a chromatic chord. It's called a Neapolitan chord. It's basically an E flat major chord and in the key of D minor. So the chromatic tone is E flat in the clarinet. And chromatic tones are unstable when they go back inside a key. So it was really important for me to have that E flat move up to E. You might also notice, take a look at the oboe part. See what I did there? I took the B flats, which are struck in the piano part, right? The same note struck, that's the way you would play it on piano. But I don't want my oboe to strike those same pitches. Instead, the oboe sustains, sustains that B flat for four beats, and then in bar two, it sustains the A for four beats. And what that does is it relaxes the line and it enables the other lines that are more interesting in the other parts to come through. All right. So let's, we're going to now shift our view to the exercise or example two, right below that. This one is going to sound a little bit more modern. It's got some rubs you can see in the sketch, right? C against the D 
the F sharp against the G in the latter part of the first bar. And um, also I want you to notice what I'm doing here. I'm not assigning necessarily from top to bottom. Take a look in the first bar. The oboe is on C. The clarinet is on D. Then the oboe moves up to D and the clarinet moves down to G. So they cross parts. And this can happen quite commonly with oboes and clarinets in orchestra as well. They cross. So the idea, what's, what we're really doing is we're, we're not concerned about the vertical as much as we are the horizontal. We want to have each, each color, right, each instrument have a, a good line, right? This starts in the key of G major and it ends in the key of E major. So the G sharp in the last bar is really the important note. And that is chromatic to G major, isn't it? So I want to approach that G sharp from a chromatic uh, half step, right? So I could approach it either from A down to G sharp or from G up to G sharp, which I chose the latter. Let's switch gears and move into a more of a jazz realm. Uh, this next piece uh, is from a project that I did with Gary Dial. It's titled Keep Swinging. It's the music of Charlie Benakis. My main role in this was to orchestrate the various horn sections. So the piece we're going to listen to is High Needles, which features Mike Stern on guitar. But the setting for this, I was trying to go for something that's really intimate and cool sounding. And so uh, I've got flute and alto flute. I'm using alto flute because the, the flute sound is so low. So uh, an alto flute to flute is somewhat more like flugelhorn is to trumpet. It, it, it gives us access to the lower, lower notes, but also uh, thicker notes when it falls within the range of the flute. With the brass, I've got, I traded the trumpet, took that out and put in the flugelhorn. So that makes the trumpet sound or makes that, that brass line a little more mellow. And then with the trum, uh, trombone, I had the trombone player use a bucket loop and that uh, definitely softens and muffles the, the sound. So, but even doing that, altering those sounds with the brass, they're still heavier than the weaker flutes. So here's the thing. If you take a look at the piano voicings, you can see they're rather low. And they get lower. So when you're working in that range, it's really not practical to ask the flute to carry the lead. It's better to take the strongest instrument, which in this quartet, is the flugelhorn. So the flugel is on the top, the two flutes are in the middle. these examples have enlightened you if you haven't thought about it uh, up to now how important it is to think about the instruments that we're writing for and then then sit down and, and work out some some things at the piano but don't just play piano all right that's really important to remember all right well thanks for tuning in Thanks for watching today's mini lesson. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Drop any questions, comments, or suggestions for future videos down below. To watch our full-length events and participate in live Q&As with our presenting artists, head to jazzcomposerspresent.com. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.